Greetings and good afternoon from Paris. I'm at the headquarters of the Institut de Formation Politique. You can see their sign here, um, which trains young activists and journalists uh, for greater engagement with the uh, ailing French democracy. Um, in a moment, I'm going to be joined by Benjamin Harnwell, the founder of the Dignitatis Humanae Institute in Rome and the director of the uh, Academy of the Judeo-Christian West, which was ignominiously stalled, paused, um, stopped by the Italian government several years ago, leading to his eviction from the monastery at Trisulti, where the academy was based. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, he was vindicated with a, a superior court overturning all the previous court rulings. And we're going to talk to him now about the next steps for the academy and when we might see it opening. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about Ben, I can say that he is a professional provocateur. Uh, he is the Europe correspondent and a political commentator for the number one rated U.S. political podcast, Steve Bannon's War Room. And I'm happy to say that he's also a contributing editor to the European Conservative. So join us for this conversation. Ben, it's great to see you from the Eternal City. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Mario. Absolutely fantastic. Look, we've known each other for a number of years now, um, but you know, and, and there's so much we could talk about, about what's going on in the world, what's going on in Europe, the geopolitical situation. But what I am most interested in knowing more about is what has happened with the Academy of the Judeo-Christian West. What are the latest developments and when can we perhaps see it starting? Well, um, the developments are these. A couple of weeks ago, we had the the, the conclusion of a three or four year-long criminal court hearing um, that was based on the accusations that the Ministry for Culture had made against us publicly. And those accusations were pretty much carried in, in the front pages of all the newspapers right around the world, not because of me or even the merits because of the Academy for the Judeo-Christian West, but because of the person under whose sponsorship this project was moving forward, and that is Steve Bannon, um, who um, is both personally known a, around the world, right? He 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 is um, known, admired, and adored right around the world, but not universally. Um, and as much as he is a load star for us uh, in our quadrant of the political spectrum, he's equally like a light bulb to moths on a hot July evening. Um, to the commies, um, and so they uh, so they did everything. They, they they literally did everything to close this project down, um, and provisionally they won. So they said that they'd sort of spread a number of um, lies. There's no other. There's, there's no. I don't. I don't know if that's a technical word for this or not. But um, a number of lies, a huge number of lies about us, myself, the Dignitatis Humanae Institute, about the project. They said that we were basically winning a training camp for Nazis. Literally, that's what they literally said. Um, it's on YouTube. Um, a, law, a local communist lawyer um, put that out. Um, she said we were winning a training camp for Nazis. Um, they said that um, the ministry said that we had defaulted on the rent. They said that we hadn't undertaken either the uh, the ordinary or extraordinary um, uh, maintenance uh, warranted, mandated by the lease. They said that I had um, made uh, criminally fraudulent statements in the tender process. They they said that we didn't have the experience necessary to participate in the tender. And you know, Mario, the beautiful thing is that after all of these things were dealt with, in the respective courts, we won every single element of every single case. So back three years ago, the administrative court, the regional administrative court said that we had all the experience necessary to participate in the tender and that we fulfilled all the tender's uh, legal requirements for participation. The court of auditors said that we hadn't defaulted on the rent. Um, and then the criminal court just about 
about a month ago, in fact. It was, it was a month, it was the 7th of, of March, and said that I hadn't made any fraud. Oh, no, no, better than that. The prosecution said in their summing up, this is, they said, look, we took this case on uh, because of the accusations that the culture ministry had made publicly and other uh, and other media sources had made publicly. Um, it's absolutely clear after all these years of criminal hearings that the defendant, me, hadn't made any fraudulent statements whatsoever in the tender. So they themselves, this is before my my lawyers got up onto their onto their feet because the prosecution goes first and the defence follows. Um, so they said. So, so they themselves asked the judge to absolve me on all of the the the. the uh, material relating to the first indi- indictment, which was the first charge, which was to do with the criminal. Hold on. Uh, so- the prosecution themselves asked. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. They said, Amazing. Well, the thing is, the thing is that the, the, the Ministry for Culture, um, which was then under the in, under the strict firm control of the communists, and so there are many will, will, will say it remains so to this day, even with the change of government, um, they made a number of accusations against me. They never want sued me for any of those things which they accused me of doing. Had I have done them, they would have been bound by law to have sued me and to, report, to, to at least to have reported it to the police. Um, because uh, like, like in the UK, like in the US, if... if, if, if um, if civil servants, if government officials become aware of a crime, they are obliged to report that crime. So a number of the things that they um, that they accused me of were, were actually crimes. Uh, at no stage did they ever sue me, um, uh, and they didn't even file amicus briefings when the state prosecutor, who was obliged by law to open and inquire on each of these uh, uh, supposed crimes, the state uh, no, they, they never filed. Um, an amicus briefing. Um, so basically, they annulled a perfectly legitimate lease. It was a nineteen-year-old lease, and they annulled this lease on the basis of claims that were not only not true, but they knew they weren't true even at the time they were making those claims. Um, that's, I think, what, what has now emerged. But of course, you know, like, like you know, like anyone who reads the newspapers can see what they're doing in, in the United States to Steve Bannon in, in the law courts, but also to Donald Trump, right? And those them's the times we're in, right? If you are if you are fighting against the establishment, these are the things that you can look. Peter Navarro, who was um Dr. Peter Navarro, Harvard educated economist, um, whom I know, um, who was Trump's um, uh, one of his sort of trade advisors is now in a federal prison because he refused to comply with um, with Nancy Pelosi's illegitimate summons, um, illegitimate, but also um, yeah, illegitimate summons to to appear before Congress. It was it was an invalid subpoena, and he refused under Donald Trump's instructions not to participate. He is now residing in a federal prison. That them no, the times we're in. Let me, let, me just, let me interject one thing. I mean, this is the instrumentalization of our democratic institutions and processes and 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 agencies by the left. And and let me just add one more thing. I don't know if you've had the, the pleasure and honor of meeting Herman Tersh, an MEP for the Vox Party in Spain, but he gave a speech a few months ago. It was incredible. I thought at the time that he was over speaking, but now on, on, in retrospect, I think he was right. He said that what we're seeing in, in these cases that you just mentioned with, with FBI and government agencies, agencies um, attacking political opponents, he says that that is shades of communism. Basically, he called it neo-communism in the democratic West. And it's amazing. It's amazing and scandalous. And we've got to fight even more, more robustly. And they call, accuse us of being fascist, right? Um, right? They use all the tricks in the book, these Stalinist show trials. I say Stalinist show trials, by the way, I, I, I never, I, I think, how many, 10 judicial, between sentences, decrees, ordinances uh, from all various types of courts and all degrees of 10 judgments we had. We only lost one of them. And, the, and that was the one that got us out of the monastery. That was the crucial one um, that we'd won basically every, 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 every other aspect. In the one that we lost to the Council of State, which is the superior administrative court, I think this Mario... 
illustrates perfectly the point you were just making, right? And the one that we lost, this is like medieval star chamber stuff, right? Um, it was, uh, uh, it was, a, 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 it was, it was, the, it, it is the superior administrative court in Italy. It's called the Consiglio di Stato, the Council of State. In that hearing, which overturned a lower vict court decision that we won, the judge basically said that I didn't need a criminal, and this was an administrative judge, not a criminal. He has no jurisdiction to pronounce on, on criminal matters. Um, he said, uh, Hanwell uh, doesn't need a criminal um, case, trial, to determine his guilt. I, I will do it myself. Um, and he said that uh, that even though the law was on my side on this, um, he was going to overturn the, the lower court's decision on the basis that um, that in Italian jurisprudence, the, the, the Italian civil service has a, has a long history of acting outside the limits of the law and can do so in this case as well. The reason why I say it was, it was medieval star chamber stuff is because this this judge, so this star on Trump would say, this so-called judge, sat in a in, in their court hearing that I was not present at, my lawyers weren't present at, there was no public allowed in, no press allowed in. Um it was basically just him um and and, and, okay. and a couple right and that is how they dispense justice. That is sh shocking but because the precedent that this is allowed and no by the way that goes against the clear letter of both Italian law and European Union law, right? But the precedent that the that, that the communists that the, the the previous government employed to get us out gave themselves the power to annul any contract with any third sector service provider at any point in time based exclusively on their word that a crime had taken place, a fraud had taken place in, in the tender process. Who is going to come in this country and invest Either in its art heritage or in its public services, if the if the, if the government can get away with that, and the answer is nobody, right? Nobody. Nobody's going okay. to come in this country and invest. I, I think the term Kafkaesque is not strong enough to describe these kind of shenanigans, these kinds of machinations. It's incredible. All right. So putting aside that, what is next? Wh when can we see the start of the academy? What 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 remains to be done before we can even get to the opening of the doors and the welcoming of students? Well, the reason that I've got the backdrop of Rome behind me, no, I, I did toy with the idea of putting the monastery as the background to, to, this, to this Zoom conference call, really to troll the left. Um, we don't have possession of the monastery. Um, that Alice was, the, the legal status of Alice is that it has been annulled. Um, so what we now need to do is when, um, is, is, basically take the sentence from the victory that we had a month ago and go to the Cassazione, which is Italy's Supreme Court of Appeal, and ask the Cassazione to overturn the, the, that judgment I was mentioning just a, a few moments ago by the Council of State, which by effective overturning that really illegitimate and astonishing sentence um, would overturn the, the, the previous Dario Franceschini, the, the, the communist culture minister's annulment of our lease, right? Uh, it's, a, it, it, it's a number of steps, but if we, if we, if we get the Council of State's sentence overturned, everything that, 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 that in itself overturned is overturned beneath it, and then the lease revert, reverts to us. And then we... The lease reverts to you, back to the, 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 the DHR. The, so there are, there are a number of possibilities. Either we go to the Cassazione and ask them to overturn the illegitimate... Um, uh, decision that was based on nothing, but has now even the pretext that it was based on has now been contradicted by the correct court, the criminal court. So we either do it that way, or we go to Strasbourg. You know, this is amusing. The hardline Eurosceptics go to the European Court of Justice in Strasbourg and get them to overturn basically the Italian government um, for the same effect to get our lease back. Or we go to the Italian Ministry for Justice and say, let that lease go, give us a new one. Give, you know, read, give us a, a new lease. Because they, haven't, because they haven't given the monastery. It's currently being run by the region of Lazio. Um, but they have disease. That, well, it's, I mean, the, the, the region, the, the, the region of Lazio has tour guides in there running tours during the day. But it's for the first time in 800 years, it's totally abandoned at nighttime. And um, there's no community there. There's nobody there. 
Uh, Not even just uh, those three, uh, three or four monks that I met uh, a few years ago. They're gone. But some of the some of them are gone with a capital G, and some of them have uh, have relocated to to other monasteries. Yeah. Understood. All right. So in in the process, uh, while all this is. I guess being sorted out. Are you um, tinkering or developing um, the syllabus, the curriculum for the program, or is this is that putting the cart before the horse? Do we have to uh, wait I, until all the legal aspects are taken care of? No, we don't, um, and we are slowly dusting off some a lot of the work that we had done three or four years ago before the legal shenanigans started picking up those threads and, and moving forward. Steve himself is doing quite a bit of work in the United States. Uh, you know, because we've moved on for years. But you know, the project that we had sort of designed for, for a political scenario, uh, well, four years ago, the legal thing started. We've been working on this for a number of years before that. We, yeah, politics has moved forward and we've moved forward. We've moved forward politically and philosophically in the needs of say 10 years ago aren't necessarily the needs today uh, in a post-Trump world. Um, and I mean, I, I mean, I don't mean post-Trump as if Trump's history. I mean, that once the phenomenon of Trump has been around, um, who has himself redefined pol politics slightly. Um, so we, you know, that we're, we're, we're talking to people, uh, we're picking up some of the threads um, in order to, to to start, I mean, the, the academy is definitely going to go ahead. Whether it goes ahead in Trisulti or another Italian monastery will be decided. Whether it goes ahead in Italy or perhaps Hungary, perhaps the United States, uh, those things can, can be decided in, in due course. Well, wherever it is that the academy ends up uh, being set up, you know that people everywhere uh, on the right will be watching and welcoming this because uh, you, you said th that we moved on. It's been four years, but things have gotten worse and the need is far more acute than ever. And uh, and hopefully my personal dream is to see this academy inspire other programs and other academies because we really need to start training the future generation of leaders uh, of, of nationalist populist uh, rebels basically that's yeah. the way we're put. yeah uh, but, but you know I, we know when we both say that things time has moved on in four years there are a number of things that we can look at people are a lot more engaged in this movement in this economic mm -hmm. nationalist movement now right and right across the world not just in the united states what trump succeeded in doing in, in um 2016 has now inspired you know it's fair to say that victor orban was it was even ahead of the game to some extent in hungary um before trump but, but because the united states is the most culturally politically economically militarily powerful nation on the planet what what happens in america is it, it has consequences elsewhere and after trump's insurgent victory in 2016 there are a whole swathe of movements now setting up uh, in countries right across the world trying to 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 to, to, to instill those revolutionary ideals in their own cultural milieu so that's one of right. the things that has changed and that's one of the things that we're going to want to sort of take on board now uh, from where we are now as opposed to 10 years ago. And one thing I want to say in, in, in a kind of closing uh, manner is that um, none of this is lost on the left, on, on the far left, on, on the progressive radicals. Um, be, and I say this because I've noticed in the last few months that they're really ramping up efforts um, to do more digging, so-called investigative journalism, which it's not, uh, against those forces on the right, against the so-called Christian right, against people like you and me. I've been seeing articles and blog posts, and there's a lot lot of activity. It's all a concerted effort, of course, by by the enemy. Um, and so we should all brace ourselves because they're going, I think they're running scared and they're worried that we are uh, on the verge of possible victory in June and, and afterwards. So we should all uh, brace ourselves and, and fight even harder. Well, look at what this difference between the, the two wings in the United States. The, lock her up was, was, a, was a big campaign rally for Trump in 2015, 2016. And everyone was chanting, lock her up, lock her up. Speaking, of course, of, of Lady Macbeth herself. As soon as he he won elections, he said, yeah, I'm not going to throw Hillary in jail. Um, that's very different from what the, how the Democrats are treating Trump. And the reason 
I think fundamentally is this. Firstly, because they're playing a different game philosophically uh, from the one we are. But secondly, um, because they know, the Democrats know, they do not have a majority of the country behind them. Um, and if they want to defeat Donald Trump, they either need to steal an election or they need to throw him in jail and liquidate his his company in order in order to get rid of him. Uh, that is the game that the Democrats play. Donald Trump could have done could have he could have done the same thing so sort of six years ago, but he was, he was magnanimous um, and he wasn't interested in playing that game. He wasn't interested in turning Donald Trump when he was president was not interested not interested in turning North America into South America. How very different from the Democrats. This will be a stain on their if they survive as a political party. This will be a stain on their on their name forever. No, we're going to crush them, or we're going to try to crush them. Here in Europe, too, we're going to crush the left. Anyway, Ben, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Harnwell of the Dignitatis Humanae Institute and the Academy of the Judeo-Christian West. Thanks, Ben. Mario, thank you so much, and thank you to our, our, our listeners and spectators who are following, uh, following this uh, transmission. <laughs>